All right, hi everyone. I'm Matt Brender. I'm a developer advocate at Basho. I'm not going to talk much about what we do at Basho, except just saying that we build Brioc. It's an open source distributed database. That's why I've been researching a lot more about other NoSQL databases and how people build a distributed system as part of a larger architecture. Um, it really comes down to discussing unstructured data, which is a confusing term. And we'll get into a few theories. Um, if you want to go learn how to develop an app, I'm, I'm not going to show any source code here. There's plenty of code on our GitHub repositories. There's actually something ca called the Taste of React, which will walk you through installing a, a client in your favorite language and actually getting your first code into our distributed database. We have a dev cluster that you can run locally, spin it up in Vagrant. There's all that stuff, but it's not about us. It's about actually trying to solve a much more complex problem. And I want to talk about some of the theories and architectures I've seen throughout that, which I find really fascinating. Because at heart, I'm, I'm more of a sysadmin than a coder, more of an ops person than a developer. I, I struggle between the two. Um, and when we, we talk about unstructured data, it's not that there's no semantics to it, there's no schema whatsoever, it's that it's just different than we're used to. We're seeing a lot more data that looks like this JSON blob of a tweet um, at go to Chicago from me, as opposed to something that fits very cleanly into a nice table with rows and columns. And uh, that's because there are just a quantity of data sources that are a little absurd these days. We have social media data streaming from Everywhere you could possibly want, you can uh, latch onto APIs to GitHub and get every commit known to mankind happening right now. Every device we have, the, the few that we have on our persons and the many more we have in our homes are all streaming logs in real time. And, uh, and these schemas change, the quantities change, uh, but the one thing that we're sure of is that there's a lot of value in correlating these disparate data types. Um, and that's interesting. Uh, if we only had a good term for that, I, I haven't heard many, so I'm going to go with the one I hear the most, that if I don't hear at least one groan in here, you'd be the first audience. <laughs> Big data. We all hate the term, but it's so good, right? It's, it's explaining this idea that there's just quantities of information that doesn't fit on a single system, or is in different forms than we're used to, and Postgres just doesn't seem to be cutting it, or MySQL isn't the best. And, I don't have enough of a budget for the Oracle database that they're trying to sell me next. Uh, so here we are, some mashup of ops and dev, and we get to be lion tamers with all this data coming in through different streams and different architectures, and we're trying to get real information out of it. Uh, but anyone that's ever inherited an architecture is familiar that you don't get to start from scratch. You don't get some beautiful playground where you get to go with um, the, the best choice on day one. You're usually building a prototype, and that prototype's on something that's very fragile if it actually achieves the scale that you're attempting to achieve. So how do we start thinking about these, and, and what are the opportunities to iterate on these along the way. Well, let's think about what big data actually encompasses, uh, even if you're still groaning at the term. There, there's a good definition of, of data growing at a scale of data velocity, volume, and variety. The information is, uh, you know, we used to be very fine with hourly or daily reports on information. Now we want as fast as real time as possible. Um, data volume, it was absolutely nothing to have uh, kilobytes um, but like growing to terabytes, and there's supposed to be something like 40 zettabytes, or uh, just numbers are getting absurd on the amount of information we want to store. Um, and then the variety, again, it used to fit into nice rows and columns, and now we're dealing with disparate types of logs, schemas that are changing on the fly, information that isn't easily normalized or denormalized, and yet you still want to correlate them. You still want your data scientists or you to uh, put together something that adds it into something of value to the business. And what I find interesting is that it's fundamentally a distributed systems problem. So uh, because data doesn't easily fit into these buckets that we're used to using, we have to think about how we coordinate across multiple machines. Now, if you want to understand the computer science behind that, there are two very smart people in the back that are both presenting today uh, that will be going into some of the theory and practice of it. Um, I'm going to talk, again, from the strategy. Let's think, let's think kind of practically um, as nerds that are newer to this. 
Uh, so when you're looking at data variety, it's the kind of information just doesn't fit naturally into a single type of database. So as opposed to trying to massage information and transform it on the fly from your application layer right down into your initial persistence layer, um, it's, it's better to be storing raw events in something that can handle unstructured data types and then parse it after the fact. Um, that, in order to achieve the scale that we're using these days, requires more than one computer. Um, when you look at the velocity, there's no one-stop shop. There's not a single platform, uh, and no one, you shouldn't believe anyone that's trying to sell you one, uh, that will be able to do everything from batch to, to real-time uh, analytics for you or storing information at the scale and variety that you're used to dealing with today. And volume, there's just different heuristics in place that you want to use when you're dealing with small amounts of data and very large quantities of data. Um, like you might be absolutely happy with storing your terabytes of information on an HDFS uh, file and uh, or distributed system, uh, or but if you're expecting anything that's remotely low when it comes to response time on the front end, that's an incredibly inappropriate choice. You need something more uh, that gives you latency guarantees. So uh, because of that, there's a solution that ends up coming up over and over again. Also not the most useful term in the world, but NoSQL is a conclusion that's quite helpful. How many people came in here very familiar with NoSQL? <laughs> okay. So a portion of you are familiar. It really, just think of it as um, something that is not uh, comfortably fitting into a relational database. Um, sometimes it comes in the form of a graph. Sometimes it's columnar. Sometimes uh, at the very basic level, it's key value. But data stored in ways other than what we've been doing for the last 40 years. And when we talk about NoSQL, uh, it, there's a lot of options. Um, this is intentionally not helpful as a graph because there are a fantastic number of varieties. Uh, key value, document stores, um, graphs, they all tend to be smushed together, but they solve slightly different problems in slightly optimized ways from each other. Um, and whether you're trying to solve a, a problem of availability at scale, or whether you're trying to find insights on the fly in a sub-millisecond way, whether you're doing text search versus relationship analysis, you have to understand that each tool has its own use case. Um, and right now, there isn't a single tool that does it all. And that's for a very good reason. There's actually quite a lot of trade-offs. Um, and I want to go through three in particular that come up as we analyze different NoSQL platforms in particular. So when we're talking about a uh, NoSQL solution, they fall, um, I found it helpful to look at these three categories of information related to them. Uh, what do they do when it comes to consistency? What are they guaranteeing? If you saw Kyle's um, keynote on Jepson, you've got a very deep understanding of consistency and what that means. Um, I'll talk to it from a higher level and take a step back from there. There's conflict resolution. So what happens when, which you eventually will always have, um, in, a cons in a distributed system, what happens when there's the opportunity for conflict? You either have high availability or you have conflict. Um, it's really one or the other. And then partitioning what happens when, or how are you separating information and spreading it out over the cluster to guarantee the sort of performance and scalability that you need. And, uh, the definition that we always come back to uh, started out as just a conjecture from Eric Brewer, um, the cat theorem, that I'm going to take a second to belabor the point in case people aren't familiar with it. I find it interesting to understand that cat theorem is really just saying that in the case of a partition in the network, what should I expect to happen? Um, will clients on each side of that partition still be able to read and or write to the database that it can see? Or is it somehow not going to be available? Are we going to sacrifice the availability uh, to guarantee some form of consistency? Um, the only thing that we can be certain of across multiple nodes is that partitions will occur. So which one are we willing to tune and for what cost? So they tend to, to break it out into the, the orbs. There's kind of an AP system is what we're generally talking about. Um, well, 
a majority of the NoSQL solutions I'll go over are AP, and that uh, provides you with a higher availability, which means lower latency, but at the cost of some of that uh, consistency that we'd have to resolve down the line. A CP system will, you know, in the partition, some, the system won't be available, but it will be able to, uh, to scale across multiple nodes. Um, so it's a question of whether you expect a 404 from your system or whether you expect an answer, even if that answer isn't the most up to date. Uh, a CA system is what you're used to. It's a Postgres database, a MySQL database. Um, so just to map those out a little and give some examples. I'm most familiar with React, the database that we make at Basho, um, and that's a, a tunable AP system. Um, Cassandra is similar. They're both based on the Dynamo paper by Amazon in 2007 that goes through basically uh, some lessons by which you can build distributed systems in a highly fault tolerant way while realizing that there's, you know, there's more important things than just consistency. If you value consistency over that, you can use a strongly consistent um, platform like Mongo or Redis. Uh, Redis, of course, for memory is in memory only, so it's more of a caching layer as opposed to being used uh, for something for persistence. So you have to understand the layers that you're going to build on top of each other. Um, and next, so focusing in on the AP systems, because I think that's really what everyone's agreed is, is quite interesting when you're going across multiple nodes. Um, in, if you have a thousand nodes and you get a partition in the middle, you don't just want all of them to be unavailable. You'd rather have two 500 node clusters that are available to, um, to read and write from. But that inevitably, if, if say we're using a key value database like React, if I write to the same key on each side, how do I know on, when that uh, partition is done that I'm going to have information that's worth having? Or, or is it just going to be smashed together in the way that uh, Kyle was showing with Jepson and seeing that information is, in fact, overwritten that shouldn't be? Um, how do we guarantee that information is correct? Uh, so it comes down to the, the way in which you deal with conflict resolution. Really, two main options. You have a last right win where you're paying attention to the, the clock on your system, or you're using something uh, different, uh, some sort of causal context. Uh, these are called vector clocks or dotted version vectors um, in, in some platforms and others. Uh, they're basically different algorithms by which you can guarantee that information is written in a certain order. Um, so to take a step back and think, OK, from a theoretical standpoint, so can I rely on the clocks in my system, or do I expect some sort of uh, cause and effect chain that I'm able to resolve on my application side? Um, it's important to understand the difference and be ready to uh, anticipate either that loss or that answer, even if that answer is, in fact, not the most recent answer you expected in the case of, of a distributed system. Next up, when you're dealing with um, multiple systems, you ultimately have to partition where information is stored. So in, uh, in a system like, like Mongo, the, the CP system, it has a master-slave methodology. So each, part, each portion of the data is stored um, and has a master and then multiple slaves or other nodes that will be able to resolve reads. Um, versus something that is using a consistent hashing table like Cassandra and React both, both do, where data is stored in some sort of construct, usually called a V node, and is uh, distributed evenly um, in an even <coughs> way across all available uh, nodes in the cluster. So if we think about the failure scenarios in these different architectures, if a node goes down in a consistent hashing ring, you have to have some sort of logic by which information is read from other nodes. Um, that is true on Cassandra and React. Uh, in, in the case where you have a master-slave methodology, there's an opportunity where a single node can go down with the master. And in that, uh, in that time, a slave needs to be elected as a master. Um, so you have a opportunity where a portion of time your database is actually unavailable, which is not actually possible in a consistent hashing design. So it's in, important to keep in mind as you, um, when you're building these systems, you're like, can I, re can I expect that a single node going down can bring down my, my infrastructure? Uh, you have to be 
you have to recognize that master's, uh, master-slave methodologies do have that risk to them while a consistent hashing algorithm actually uh, works around that where you have some sort of quorum you define and as long as that quorum of nodes is available, your system will be available. To see that in a little greater context, this is React specific, so you'll have to excuse me, but um, with data in React, if we had a four node cluster this time, data is distributed across a consistent hashing algorithm and actually chunks of information is spread evenly across each node. You can see that um, a portion of that, of that consistent hashing table is actually uh, stored on each V node and then lands on each of the physical nodes. Um, ultimately meaning that data will be evenly spread across all nodes. What, what makes that important is that you want some sort of predictable scalability to your infrastructure. And uh, while a master-slave methodology, usually you have to define where data is gonna be going um, from your application logic, like you're adding some sort of semantic on top of what, you, uh, what you've built from a database, while in a consistent hashing ring you are actually, um, the system will be dispersing it automatically for you based on an algorithm. It saves you some application logic and it uh, provides a more linearly scalable model. So let's switch gears and talk a, a few tactics about designing uh, your information and, and how you store it. Um, we're gonna put a thinking cap on. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm asked a lot, well, I usually hear the statement that my data is too complex for key value databases. Uh, this NoSQL thing is, that's fine, but I need a relational database with nice transactions and the certainty and, and stability that I'm used to. Um, and I, I find like the, the thought experiment that gets people in the right mindset is asking the question of um, what questions do you anticipate you need to ask so are you going to be asking like on a per user basis, what kind of orders are they gonna have or uh, in a hierarchical tree of information, like what are the subtrees? Um, so if you can answer that question in a nice atomic way, you can write that information uh, down, then a key value is an absolutely perfect architecture for your, your need. Uh, set it in a simpler way, we can go old school, the original key value uh, data store here is the Dewey Decimal System. Uh, every time you write information down on a card, it, it has a definitive answer on the other side and you can go get that. Um, aggregating data in that way is actually very effective and when you can rely on each key being available in this, in this method, you can scale uh, in a very nice way. Um, stolen from a fantastic blog post talking about data modeling, Here's an example of thinking about uh, the branches of information on an e-commerce site and seeing some arbitrary amount of that information uh, is being seen as a single tree and is gonna be stored in a single aggregate. This won't be denormalized, so you're actually gonna have some repeat data, but it's gonna be little JSON blobs. It's not that much in the amount of space and it's going to be so much quicker on a read that it'll be worth, worth your time to do so. Um, which is a, a totally different way of thinking from a relational database. Another, another blog post that really uh, influenced the way I've been understanding how to design data types is actually thinking about them uh, from the angle of a stream processing system. So seeing events in a, a more immutable way, um, borrowed thankfully from, from Martin, um, from his talk at dev uh, slash dev winter, yeah in London, um, he talks about instead of formulating data in a way where you're updating a, a table as opposed to updating a value as it stands on a current file or in a key value as opposed to reading that key value, updating a quantity in a cart and putting that key value back, um, try to think of everything as a state and time and save those as raw files or raw, raw events um, and that will uh, enable you to think of your architecture in a totally different way. So um, his example is to add information to a cart. At the first time you add that information, it could, you could have a quantity of one of, that, of whatever you're buying, and then you could update it to three, and then you can update it to two. As opposed to having some relative value and subtracting and, and doing that, each, each of these are true statements. They're, they're in and of themselves accurate. 
Um, what's nice about that is that in the case of a conflict, um, you can use something like the dotted version vector logic we were talking about and be able to resolve this um, more certainly. And you could also feed it into some other system, taking that raw information and seeing that, oh, my users actually changed their card a few times before this, and that might have some downstream interesting ramifications. So I uh, also want to talk about some of the architectures that are quite interesting and have been brought up over um, in our initial conversation at the, at the keynote. Um, and just to remember what kind of problems we have to deal with as you know, systems people, looking at lots of different systems that are built, try to report on something like this, which is, was the real data platform that was behind LinkedIn before they started um, migrating and building uh, Apache, what is now Apache Kafka. So they had uh, a number of application services with uh, queries on top going into, they had messaging queues leading to more apps, leading to key values. There's log aggregation on the side being stored on, on disparate data types. There's uh, really no clear pathway where information is traveling in any sort of way that would give you um, an opportunity to replay information in that immutable way we were just talking about and be able to do some interesting analytics on top of this. So uh, what they propose and what they have um, since moved to at LinkedIn is something more like this. And I really love this, this architecture. It's obviously easier to read, but applications are storing to some local information or some sort of database that's appropriate for the application, right? Like if you're, if you're trying to do some analysis on relationships, you would have some sort of social graph, but you may also write that data to something persistent um, or with a guaranteed persistence level like a, a NoSQL AP system that scales linearly. Uh, and then you could also pull that information either directly out of the key value store or or also store it into a search, like Elasticsearch, and be running some um, queries on top of that. Uh, what I love about this is that it then feeds into some sort of streaming data platform, which they, of course, would recommend Kafka. They built it. Um, but you can use AP uh, NoSQL solutions as well for a streaming system, where information can be pulled out from that central source now. And uh, well, yeah, you can use a you could use a database like that. But Kafka is really cool in the fact that uh, it allows you to have some sort of offset for your information. So uh, each stream is actually a repeatable list of data in a certain order that you can pull off and feed into all these different systems. And then ultimately, it could, it could plop down into something like Hadoop, and you can do some um, further batch processing, processing after that. Um, so when we start thinking about architectures, we can think about something like an error, error analysis system where you are storing information primarily onto uh, your NoSQL solution, and then you either have it paired with a, a solar cluster, have some sort of, um, or using a document store where you can do that search and pull information out right there. Um, if you're doing something where you're trying to find other patterns, you could, you could do what we were showing in that top level architecture where applications are writing using a multi client write model to multiple data, data stores simultaneously and then have some sort of um, batch systems on top of that. Or yeah, it's almost always a batch system pulling information either out of that uh, faster, lower latency product or um, stored on top of HDFS and then running something on top of that. Or yet again, you can store information in NoSQL do some sort of ETL process uh, where you're extracting, you're transforming your information and pushing it into that messaging queue now that it's in a, a, a cleaner format um, and then pull that into whatever sort of analytics platform you're using today. Um, so just to visualize that a little, uh, again, borrowing from the amazing work on, by the Kafka team, um, showing some sort of web service uh, pushing information directly to an event stream. Um, and that, then the raw information could be stored on something like a, a NoSQL database. And then you can also be aggregating that information and storing it to uh, another bucket on the same database or something different. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility to building these things. It's just uh, really thinking about how are you storing immutable information.
um, looking at, at another architecture that explains it from a uh, kind of resp response time angle. Uh, relational databases, NoSQL databases, other apps all expect very low latency. They can feed information into something like a, a streaming platform like Kafka, and then you can um, have these levels of batch analytics following after. Um, and then it was uh, brought up briefly, but uh, a Lambda architecture, which supposedly can break CAP theorem, but is really uh, just a non-linearizable way of seeing information both as uh, the bulk like speed layer of information that's happening regularly and then uh, the slower batch layer of information and then aggregating those once requests come downstream. Uh, but the, the sort of architecture of these things is quite, uh, can be quite complex, um, but it has the benefit of having both your, lower, your faster um, data with your batch data. So just to take a step back, like, the reason this is all interesting is that you can't really analyze the information that you haven't been able to store. So storing information ends up being a very complex problem that you need to take into consideration. Um, and as you do so, there are a great deal of challenges to balance, like how, what are my latency expectations for each of these applications? Um, how am I going to maintain these? How do they handle uh, conflict resolution? Uh, and what you find very quickly is that most of this works at very small scale. Uh, it gets complex once you go across multiple systems, which gets into an uh, absurd problem of distributed systems. Um, so to summarize some of the, uh, the core problems we're dealing with, there's some terms here. Um, I, like, I like thinking of NoSQL as uh, something that's really just a, a collection of highly available, scalable systems that fall within the, the problem of the CAP theorem. Um, unstructured data is just any sort of information you're trying to parse. Uh, and then some of the architectures we were talking about and some of the tools. So, I certainly ended early. Happy to, um, to bring up more specific cases and discuss them, but thank you all.